Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Shield, your trusted source for analysis. Stephen Gilbo and MP Wilkinson come in front of the press today to complain that Pierre Polyev is making them look bad, and that if it wasn't for Pierre Polyev, Canadians would all of a sudden decide that they want to spend all of their money on the carbon tax. Brought out a couple of MPs from the Environment Committee, stood them up behind them. It was really kind of sad. And, it, you know, you, you could find sympathy for them if they weren't destroying so many lives and they weren't completely and utterly against listening to anything that you have to say. It was about 20 minutes long, this, this press release, and 15 minutes of it was them talking, it was these two ministers, Gilbo and Wilkinson, talking about how Pierre Polyev hurts their feelings and makes them mad, and they, he wishes, they wish they could, he could just censor Pierre Polyev. The fact that Canadians support Pierre Polyev based not on, see, that's, I'll point to the, the fact, but the problem with the far left is that they don't believe you're making your own decisions, right? They just think that you're following along blindly instead of looking at your life and saying, hey, wait a second, this guy's got a good point. So I'm going to open with a couple of things that Wilkinson said, which are absurd on the face of it. And when I break it down for you, you'll see even worse. Say some of the more recent colorful language that he has been using around things like nuclear winter are simply ridiculous and not becoming of a leader in a major G7 country. They are stupid and he should know better. Oil and gas will peak this decade. In fact, uh, oil is probably peaking this year. First of all, do you hear the judgment in the guy talking about how he doesn't agree with P the way Pierre Paulie was explaining to Canadians the horrible oncoming disaster of the economy and therefore Pierre Polyev, MP Wilkinson, has the right to tell Pierre Polyev how to talk, how to think, what to think, who to talk to. He has that right. He's, he's so judgmental that he doesn't even consider the fact that when people do that to him, he just looks down his very hoity-toity nose, his snooty little approach to life, and says that they don't know as much as he knows. But when the shoe is on the other foot, all of a sudden he thinks that it's okay to try and tell Pierre Polyev what he can say to his voting population, what he can say to the public, all of that stuff. But then he continues along and finally ends up by saying, oh, oil and gas will probably peak this decade and maybe even this year. So the, in his mind, we shouldn't bother investing in it, despite the fact that it'll be at its highest and most valuable for the next six years. I mean, imagine the, the logic in the guy to say to yourself, well, you know what? There's a lot of money being made right now, but we don't want to do that. We'll just ignore it. We'll let China make the money. We'll let America make the money. We'll let everybody else make the money because we don't wanna you know, sell our fuel to Europe and we don't wanna sell our fuel to all of the countries that are desperately needing it. They're so desperate for it that they are creating a demand that is causing it to peak. I don't understand how these guys get votes. I swear to you, I don't. Then they made the mistake of trying to talk to the press about their philosophies. And the press, for their credit, kinda hit them you know, in the bread basket. I didn't, they didn't press the issue but they did ask them logical questions that exposed the flaws in their own um, ideology. Is there a world in which the government scales back the rate of increase of the carbon price or does something else to kind of uh, soften it uh, to help with affordability concerns in, in the next election? In the coming I, I would um, sincerely disagree with the premise of your question that carbon pricing is, is hurting affordability. I think that both what Minister Wilkinson and I have shown, demonstrated, what 300 economists, independent organizations have also shown, is that uh, the majority of Canadians are better off with carbon pricing and the rebate than, than without it. So, the anti, so that's the first answer to the question. The second, answer to your, second part of the answer to your question is no. In no way, shape or form is he going to entertain getting rid of the carbon pricing, carbon tax, call it whatever you want. There's no way in his mind that he can find a halfway medium. There's no way in his mind that he, this is what's called an ideologue. This is a person who doesn't care what's happening to you, who has tunnel vision, who will drive you right off the edge of the cliff if they think that it will get them to what they want. This is what ideology looks like. It's people who refuse to compromise. It's people who refuse to make any, uh, any sort of um, 
agreement where they can meet halfway. They don't want to meet you halfway. They just refuse. So de despite the fact that you are feeling hardships, despite the fact that, that all of the things that are going on in your life, this guy says there in no way, shape or form is he willing to find any form of a compromise. Now I appreciate what that says. I understand how that impacts your life and understand how many times he stood up there and acted like he is so much smarter than the rest of us. There's going to be another good example for, it. I mean, right there, he's like, Oh, I reject your premise and no way, shape or form. Am I going to be, uh, and it's like, bud, you need to listen to the people. You're not, uh, it's not the other way around here, but you can't tell them that because he's ideologically driven. He doesn't care about the results. He doesn't care about the backlash. He doesn't care about the fallout. He only has this one little vision in his mind. But how can you say it doesn't have an impact on affordability when almost a year ago, the prime minister stood here and announced a carve out for home eating, heating oil um, as Canadians complained and, and talked about a cost of living crisis. I don't want to monopolize the microphone, maybe my friend. Like, but was that not the moment where your government admitted there was a connection between carbon pricing and affordability? No. Um, so one of the things that we have always said is that the price on pollution needs to be put in place in a manner that is affordable for Canadians. The one exception in terms of people getting more money back were people who actually heat their homes with heating oil because it's much more expensive, three to four times as expensive than natural gas in most parts of the country. And so we looked at that situation. We said we actually need to address that issue in the context of an affordability challenge. So if I understand you correctly, this fuel, home fuel, heating fuel was so expensive that you gave people in Nova Scotia a break for it, despite the fact that it's used in a much larger proportion in the province of Quebec. And when you say to me that you're re 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 reimbursing all of the carbon money that you collect or this tax that you collect, isn't it collected on a percentage? And should that percentage not be applied to no matter what the price is? So if it's jet fuel, whether it be carbon that you're putting in your greenhouse, whether it be diesel, whether it be gas, whether it be propane, doesn't matter what carbon it is, they have a, a percentage put on it. So that's reflected in the market. The market charges this much and then that carbon tax is added to that and that price comes back to your pocket. That's the story that they are trying to sell. Except apparently in Nova Scotia, it was more expensive. So they, in their mind, you, they want you to believe that they couldn't put more tax back in the person of Nova Scotia's pocket, right? Like, I mean, wouldn't, if they were being honest, if they were being for, truthful, wouldn't they just say, well, Everybody in Nova Scotia gets this much money unless you're heating your house on, on oil and then you get three times that much because you're heating your house on oil. Or wouldn't they just say, okay, you're heating your house on this uh, heat, home heating oil, so we'll just collect the receipts and then we will send you back that, that much extra money because you, you paid that much extra in taxes. And why would they not apply that across the board? Why would they not say, well, it's not only Nova Scotia, but it's New Brunswick, it's PEI and Quebec. By all accounts, Quebec has the most of them and by not a small amount, right? And which makes sense because Quebec has a larger population. So just by virtue of them having more people in it, it stands to reason that more people are using it. And so if more people are using it, then why are you not giving this rebate to everyone? If what you say is true, if you say to yourself that you did it because you, for some reason the market is 3%, three or four times more, and, and when you apply the percentages to it, somehow that changes the way that the rebate gets collected, which makes no sense to me at all. These guys don't have anything other than this is what we want and that's all there is to it and don't you dare question us. That's what you're hearing here, in my opinion. Why do you think your climate plan is not resonating with Canadians? Well, it's much easier to say ax the tax and, and leave it at that than to explain to Canadians, well, climate change is real and we need to, do be, we need to be doing something about it. And this is one of the measures we've put in place and, and this is how it works. Like, you can say ax the tax in 10 seconds, explaining why we need to act on climate and, and how carbon pricing and the rebate works takes, is much more difficult. So are you suggesting Canadians just don't get it? No, I'm saying it's a complex issue. And it's been a comp I've been working on climate change. I've been I've been working on climate change for over 30 years, and and over those 30 years, many organizations have been working to help Canadians understand. And Canadians are no different than, than Europeans or Americans. It is a complex issue to understand. Well, there you have it. 
Stephen Gobo has said it the quiet part out loud. It's not that you don't get the fact that it's harming your life. It's just that you're not smart enough to understand the nuances of a person who started his career by climbing on the roofs of houses of women. Right? I mean, he went up on the roof of uh, Premier Klein's house and then scared the jeepers out of his wife. Klein wasn't even there, but he didn't care. Then he climbed CN Tower and he said, oh, look at me, look at me. And then he decided to go and get a, you know, a 18 month diploma for, for political science. And then he ran for politics. And for all of that reason, he knows more than you do. He knows more than you do. He, he gets, based on his experience, he knows the economy better. He knows how your life works better. He knows all of these things better. And so it's not that Pierre Polyev is, is talking to people and listening to them and, and understanding what it is that's troubling their lives and what's causing them to have hardship. No, no, it's not that. It's just that you are not smart enough to understand the subtle nuances of the towering genius that is MP Gilbo. Ah, it's good. It's good. It's not insulting at all. And I think that Gilbo has missed his mark. He should probably just be solving world hunger. That's probably, that's the towering intellect that we got going on there. It may no longer support a consumer carbon price. What do you make of that then? If they don't support it, if the province of British Columbia is ready to walk away from its own consumer carbon pricing, is it fair to argue that the national consensus still exists that this is a viable policy? I don't think the NDP knows what the, where the NDP stands on this. Um, we've heard the, the leader of the NDP says that he, he, was no, he wasn't sure, but we've heard MPs saying, no, 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 we still support carbon pricing. So I think you should ask them, really. Now, for those of you keeping score at home, that's also the NDP who doesn't know any better. No matter what you say to this guy, it's just that you don't get it. No matter how smart you might be, no matter how much experience you have, no matter who you are in, in life, if you disagree with the far left, the far left just wants to call you unintelligent. Columbia, I think, is a little bit different from the federal New Democrats who seem to be at sea in terms of what their plan is to address climate change. Um, and I think there are a lot of folks who voted for the NDP in 2021 who, who will be questioning um, what they are doing with respect to climate change. But the, the comments most recently by Premier Eby, and I've discussed this with Premier Eby, um, were, were interesting. And I have suggested to Premier Eby that the challenge with the British Columbia plan is exactly what he says. It's affordability because they take a lot of the money into general revenue and they do not give it back. So I think the way to solve the affordability challenge, which Premier Eby raised, it wasn't a climate issue. It was an affordability issue. It was to actually put in place the federal system, which actually ensures that most people get more money back. So there's a huge flaw in what you're saying. Because it, everybody will say that the British Columbia has had their system in place for longer and that it, 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 it goes along with the guidelines of the, of the federal government. They say the same thing about the one in Quebec. Except what you just said was that it's causing affordability issues. Now, your, the federal liberal line is, oh, we are taxing things that are essential so that you will stop using those essential things and start to use our replacements except there are no replacements. So they are simply gouging you for these essential items, which is exactly the problem with the system, which is exactly, and it just, he just admitted that the system does not work based on the idea that you're going to force people to use something that's not there, right? We're going to punish people for putting gas in their car, but they got no other way to get around. We're going to punish people for heating their homes, but they got nothing else to heat, heat it with. We're going to punish people for light and wood outside, but they got nothing to replace it with. I mean, the idea that he just stood there and said that there's an affordability issue by taxing people on their essential everyday needs. And what they really need to do is just tax people the way that the federal government does. So because they are replacing it with nothing. So they know that this tax will go on forever because they're not giving you any choices. Oh, electric cars, electric cars, electric cars, except where are you going to plug it in? I mean, you, you're going to be running around with a, you know, 100 mile extension cord so you can keep it plugged in at your house. You can't plug them in. Everybody knows the grid is 10 years away from even being viable for some of our highest density locations in Canada. But these guys don't care about any of that. And the grid that they do have is all powered by diesel. So who's paying that carbon tax? It's unbelievable, the arrogance. And they did this in, a, in an effort to convince you to not support Pierre Polyev anymore. 
I mean, they actually stood up there and said Pierre Polyev is going to be put in a motion for a no confidence vote. And this was their response to it. This was what their response. On the one breath, they'll say, oh, no, Canadians are starting to like the carbon tax. And on the other hand, they're basically up here begging and pleading for you to just not look at the facts, not look at your life, but just vote for them anyway. And then they wonder why people are exiting in droves. I mean, Pablo Rodriguez, who's decided to run for the Liberal Party in Quebec, is now sitting as an independent so how much further do you want to distance yourself from Justin Trudeau if you not only do you resign your post, but you leave the federal party altogether? <laughs> Come on. These guys are, they just need to get out of the way so that the rest of us can fix the mess that they caused. And that's all there is to it. Anyway, that's my opinion. You can let me know what your opinion is down in the comments. I'll talk to you next time.